decided to turn it over to Bree Ray, our communication specialist and social media influencer extraordinaire, and she'll uh, introduce John Sperry. Check, check. <laughs> you guys, thank you for being here. Welcome back to Review. We're excited to have you. Give it up one more time for that incredible presentation on the do's and don'ts. <laughs> All right, with us today we have John Sperry. He is the entrepreneurial face behind Halo Site and brings a combination of creativity, technology, and practicality to every opportunity he encounters. He serves as the CEO and brings a focus on growing people and investing in the company's culture. Before founding Halo Site, John co-founded In Moment, growing the company for 17 years with offices in six countries and over 400 employees ultimately led to a successful exit. So let's give it up for John Sperry. Can you hear me? <laughs> I promise I turned. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> How's everybody doing? All right. Well, good, good. John, I would love to kind of start at the beginning with you. Um, well, actually, let's start where you are now and work backwards. Can you tell us more about Halo Site and what you're working on with that? Yes, I will. But I'm first going to say, you don't need VC money. <laughs> we'll get into that. I've, I've, my two successes came without VC money. My one failure came with VC money. So I'll, I'll, that's the backdrop. How's that sound? That's great. That's great. Um, what I'm doing right now, uh, my new company, Halo Site, uh, is uh, a Salesforce app exchange company. Does anybody know Salesforce? Raise your hand if you've heard of Salesforce. 160,000 businesses are on Salesforce. That's a lot. I just sold a business for you know 10 plus figures uh, that had 400 clients. Salesforce has 160,000. It's kind of crazy. Wow. So anyways, big market opportunity out there and a problem I've been thinking about for oh, a few years now uh, was regarding unstructured data, you know, text, emails, chats, case notes, all that stuff. Inside of any database of any business out there, about 80 to 85% of the data is unstructured data. So if you're building a company that analyzes structured data, the business intelligence community, for example, which is a big space, it's a $100 billion space, <laughs> it's crazy. The companies in that space are like on version 17 of their software. So wading in to compete with those giants is not a casual thing. I, I spent nine months kind of thinking, should I do this? <laughs> there's a big space and there's big competitors. But it's crazy because that $100 billion space focuses on 10 to 15% of the data. It's kind of crazy. So I spent the last 14 years within a moment before this working on unstructured data, text analytics, natural language processing, machine learning, go on and go on. Everyone calls it AI now, but it's, it's a little more complex than just saying that. And uh, I realized that there was an opportunity inside Salesforce, a friend of mine who helped me actually start off in a moment, was a product manager over at Salesforce, and I called him up about this idea I had to crack this problem with unstructured data, to allow it to be fully analyzed by businesses. And he said, do you know much about the app exchange? I'm like, no, that's why I'm calling you. <laughs> and he's he's super smart guy. Kurt Williams helped me co-found uh, both InMoment and now Halo Site. And uh, he was telling me, he goes, you know, uh, you get access to all the data in there. That's exactly what the biggest problem I'd always seen is text analytics is typically on the outside, right? So you buy a text analytics platform, you move all the data to it, which you already had a database, so you have to integrate everything with it. It's a, it's a lot of money, so not that many people do it. And then when they're done, they don't exactly have answers. They have a generic pro platform that processes information and doesn't address specific questions. So what I saw with Salesforce was an opportunity to have the data, deal with the data security and privacy issues because I'm an app in the app exchange. Much like on your phone, you guys install apps every day and you never even ask where it came from. It's because it's been, you know, people have gone through and checked it already. Well, that's the same thing with the Salesforce app exchange. 
They put you through a rigorous sales process and make sure that everything's been checked out ahead of time. So what we have access to as part of the Salesforce App Exchange is all that data. So a good example of one of our beta clients is Ivanti. You guys heard of Ivanti? They're building a big building up off 104th there. They get about 100,000 emails every month into their help desk. Who's reading those? <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? So the people who are reading that are, are your, well, typically your lowest paid employee. It's your help desk people, right? And that they probably have some of the least amount of information. And their goal is to close out that one problem, that one complaint, that one misunderstanding, whatever it might have been. So what we can do is actually read all those emails with our technology, parse them out, and then provide answers to specific questions like, what are the top five complaints last month? Well, you can't even do that today with these systems, right? It's kind of crazy because it's all in the comments that people wrote in the emails. Well, what are the top five feature requests? Wouldn't you guys like to know that? I know I would every day as a product manager. I'd love to know what the cop requested features are. What were the training or implementation problems? So on and so forth. Anyways, we're working with 24, well, 25 uh, brands up and down the Wasatch here. Uh, that have joined our free beta program. Uh, one thing I told Darren is if you guys want to, if you're on Salesforce, we'd be glad to process your data for free and help you guys out. So reach out to Halo site, sign up for a free beta. We'd be glad to help you guys process your data and help you understand what's going on with your customer base. But to what we're doing at Halo site. That's incredible. That's incredible. And thank you for that support for entrepreneurs to work with Halo site. That's incredible. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, you mentioned to me a while back that right now is an incredible time to be an entrepreneur. Can you expand on why you think right now is a great time for that? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, thank you. Uh, it is a great time to be an entrepreneur. Uh, when I started up in Moment, I had so many things that I had to do before I even get to focusing on my company's product. I had to go through and get the office space, which is still a problem today, but it's a heck of a lot easier, especially if you have someone like Rev, you know, Rev Road come along and help you. I had to build the network for my office. I had to build the email server for my office. Outlook, if you guys, probably, if you guys anybody know what Exchange is anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I, had to, I was the Exchange admin for my company. It was me and one other guy. But I had to put all that stuff in place. I had to build the, the hardware that we were gonna host our servers and everything else on. I had to build the switches, which are a telephony voice over IP switch. I mean, just crazy amount of stuff just to get to the point where I could actually build my product. Probably 85 to 90% of the stuff that I had to do wasn't towards building my product. It was scaffolding. Does that make sense? It was like just extraneous stuff that has very little value to my core value prop to the business. Well, today, there are so many big platforms and big kind of groups out there that have changed to help leverage you to be your scaffolding. Like you just add water and poof, you got scaffolding. It's, it's just amazing to me. Uh, we went through and did a prototype of Halo site for feasibility to see if we should do it or not. Went through and pulled together a few friends, some people I knew at Salesforce, some people I knew at Amazon, and went through and built a prototype in three days and said, wow, this is viable. It took me 18 months the last time do my feasibility test to say, should I do this anymore? Three days, 18 months. It's just amazing. And there's tons of great platforms out there. So like with Salesforce, and just as, as an example, uh, they are a database. They are a login. They are a visualization. They're an analytics platform. They're all those things that I don't have to build. They're my extra scaffolding. So I have one-sixth as much as I need last time around. So I get six times the leverage with the same people than I had the last time I built in Moment. So it's just a great time to be an entrepreneur right now. Lots of great resources for us to utilize. With that said, entrepreneurship is incredibly difficult. Um, so what were some of the most challenging obstacles that you face in your entrepreneurial years? So the first time sucks. <laughs> it just <laughs> does. I mean, I, don't let anybody tell you it was just a wonderful thing. It was so hard. God, it was just so hard. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, we, we bootstrapped in moments, uh, went two years without pay, uh, made all sorts of sacrifices. There's a group of 10 of us there that did a whole lot of work before we made it. <coughs> Pardon me. And probably the hardest thing I had in there, we knew how to build technology. 
We, we knew the space, the opportunity, the potential. We knew all of that. But just getting someone to buy it when no one else has bought it, man, it's so hard. <laughs> no referenceable accounts. You're walking in, you're like, well, hey, down the street, the little taco place uses us. <laughs> you're just like trying to sound impressive. You're like, it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you, you, you got to get that first one that believes in you. And it was weird because we started off in restaurants. And then literally our conference room table was my mother-in-law's kitchen table. It's classy, right? <laughs> and I remember sitting down with the COO of Great Clips. They had 2,000 Great Clips hair, you know, hair salons. We didn't have a single hair salon on our platform. And I asked him, so are you going to do it? He's like, I like you guys. You seem scrappy. Yes. And suddenly we had a referenceable account. After that, we got Hertz. We got Marriott. We got all sorts of other big brands after that. But before that, we had kibbles and bits. Just nothing. It just couldn't get there. So that referenceable account is so critical. So using networking, using other types of things. Money isn't as important as if you get a referenceable account. By far the best thing you can possibly get. With, with Halo Site, I do a beta program. I offer free analysis for people. And so I, in one week I presented to Vivint, Lucid, and um, uh, who was the other one? Another big one. <laughs> I presented to three uh, unicorns here in the Wasatch Front. All three said yes, because I'm offering something they can't get, and they don't have to pay for it, it's an install, there's no risks. You do what you can to get a referenceable account. So as soon as you have a referenceable account, oh, it was Pluralsight, Pluralsight was the other one. And as soon as you get accounts like that, people start paying attention. As soon as I said Pluralsight, Lucid, and Vivint to you, you guys all know who are my beta customers. Mm -hmm. And I got another 20 plus like that because I approached it the same way. So getting referenceable accounts, granted, it's a lot easier the second time around, I'm not gonna deny that. But getting referenceable accounts, figure out how you're gonna do it. Figure out who you're going to network, who you're going to go through and ask some you know, tough questions. I, I, I ask favors. That's what I did. So go in and ask for that favor. Get that done. Over a kitchen table that's your mother-in-law's, whatever it takes. <laughs> I think you said something really important. I think you, you mentioned that you had something that they couldn't get, and that's what really helped you get some referenceable accounts, right? What advice would you give to those starting businesses to make sure they have that white space and they have that room for growth and they have really something that is needed in the industry. Yeah, I think this is um, a big misnomer that people have is that everybody wants a better mousetrap. Hmm. If I came to you today, all of you in here, with the best mousetrap in the world, how many of you would buy it right now today before you leave this networking event? Yeah, you don't even care, do you? <laughs> and that's what it comes down to. But if I had a lightsaber you could buy, literally a working lightsaber, how many of you would sign up on a list? I would. I mean, like, freaking cool, man. Yeah, it's something I can't get today. <laughs> so it's white space, right? Something people can't get. I'd totally buy a lightsaber. Like a working one I could cut through walls with? I mean, come on. That's cool. So figure out what it is. If you're looking at your product and you're saying, it's just a better mousetrap, really evaluate it. I had an idea I'd become enamored with. I spent nine months on the business plan. I was super excited about it. I was going to build it, not Halo site. And finally, I looked at myself and I said, it's just a better mousetrap. Who cares? And I drowned it. Just, you, know, just, you have to. So you got to get kill these ideas you get totally attached to. And you just have to sit and go, oh. I mean, we saw some last week, Bart. It was like, oh, it's just a better mousetrap. Go kill that thing. <laughs> it's just not worth it. Nobody's interested. So white space is an important thing. It's something that someone hasn't addressed yet, right? or in a different way that people view it as new. Mm. Like, preparer isn't doing anything new, but they're doing it in a different way that has the appearance of new to them, right? That's an important thing. So finding the white space that people are excited about. The other thing is good, I have, I have a friend of mine, I, I, t I try to tell him this, but you know, sometimes advice just it goes on deaf ears. <laughs> he's going to business, and he's going after a business that's literally, his payroll. How many of you have payroll? You're little small companies. Still have payroll, right? That's kind of what everybody has. Guess what businesses already do? They do payroll. And he says, I've got the best payroll system idea that's out there. And everybody needs a payroll system. It's a better mousetrap, right? The bigger problem is when someone already has a mousetrap and it's already working, 
like payroll, for example. What is exactly happening with payroll? It's a check to an employee, a deposit in their bank account, EFT, whatever, Venmo, I don't care. It doesn't really matter. People are getting paid and they're happy with it. If you are trying to sell into a space that's existing products are there, you have to kick out somebody. That means your sales cycle is whatever their annualized sales cycle is, which means it's probably gonna be 12 to 16, 18 months to get a deal. And that sucks. But if you're selling something that they don't have yet, that does address a need, maybe that they were unaware of. Like with Halocyte, I asked Steve Dale, the CEO of Ivanti, and I said, have you ever used any of these 100,000 emails you get a month to make an executive decision on steering your business? And he looked at me and he goes, how would I do that? I said, well, sign us up, we'll help you out. So figure out what that is, that white space opportunity. Then they're gonna go through and there's no barriers. You're not kicking somebody else out. That, that can destroy you in the beginning if you're trying to build something that everybody already has one of. I've already got one, right? You, you don't wanna be selling that product, that, well, I've already got one. Because it's, it's, it's a battle, it's a battle to win. Thank you. Um, let's talk about partnerships. When building the business, how important are partnerships and how do you keep the partnerships that you have healthy? So I'm, I'm gonna zoom in on that a little bit. Okay. Um, you need to know what your core is. This is a problem in technology companies and in any other type of company. People tend to want to do all sorts of things. To be able to know who to partner with and what you're doing internally versus externally, you first need to know your core. What is that one thing you're doing that sets you apart from everything else? Then you can start deciding on what things you're gonna do in source, outsource, build by partner, right? Go through the whole exercise. Technology people inherently, and I've seen it, it happens in a lot of places. People like to do, to do their own, to build their own stuff. You go to Walmart, they want to build everything themselves. It's just kind of crazy. I've had three different companies that I've presented to Walmart, and they all want to build everything themselves. And you're like, really? I mean, what, what business are you in? And that's the question you'd ask yourself is what business you're in. If you're doing things outside of your core, like you're trying to build, like say, for example, a program says, I think we can build a better time clock for our employees. Go take them out back and just shake them around a little bit because that's just crazy, right? There's no reason for that. Buy one. They're off the shelf. It, and it shouldn't say, well, we could save money. I promise you'll save more money if your expensive people are focused on your core capabilities. So there's your core items that you're doing. You need to own those. You can't outsource that. If you're outsourcing it, it's not your core. And you really need to evaluate your business plan, okay? Because if you don't have something that is so core that you, you have to be doing that. Secondary items, as much as you can, try to get those either purchased or partnered, right? You, you just don't want to be building stuff that's not part of your core. And tertiary items, you always outsource. You always partner and get someone else to do. So that would be just saying, well, leading up to what, what you want for a partner, well, you want them to leverage your core. You better know your core before you even start going out and partnering because most partnerships, 80, 90% of them are a distraction from your business. So before you go out and do that, figure out your core. Really know it. And that's going to help you in figuring out who you're going to partner with. Then you can get just a couple, and it's, instead of getting 20 partnerships that's just going to be a distraction to you, go get two or three that really matter. What advice would you give um, to startups when it comes to raising money and spending money? Burn rate. <laughs> Burn rate's a tough thing, right? It's, it's a hard one to face. Um, the higher your burn rate, the bigger that problem is every payroll. It's, it's a tough thing. It just is. Now, I know this is going to sound like a silly way to address it, but the lower your burn rate, the easier that payroll is. And do everything you can to keep that down while you're trying to formulate your product, trying to figure out your space before you go out and do something else. Do all that ahead of time. Pay the dues like Prepero's done. Um, don't be hunting for VC money. Uh, it's sad. Even after VCs invest in that, VCs plan on 1 in 10 making it. It's kind of crazy, right? Uh, that's just crazy odds. And I think there's some problems uh, with... Uh, I've, I've got a bunch of my friends that they love working at a company that brags about how much money they raise and sticking up on a billboard. Does anybody think that helps them be successful? 
That's kind of crazy, right? Hey, congratulations, I gave a lot of my business away to some outside investors. No, I, we want you to own your business. When in moment bought um, Empathica, a direct competitor of ours, about our same size, but not as well structured. So we got them for, I don't know, 40, 50 million, I'm trying to remember, but it, it, it was an interesting deal. Uh, the founder had started the business up 12 months, 12 years prior, pardon me. And uh, I was sitting down at lunch with him, congratulating him and t tell him, hey, this is a pretty awesome time for you. You're getting right off in the sunset. And he goes, he had this really sad look on his face. And I said, well, what's wrong? And he goes, I, I didn't do as well as I'd hoped. And of course, on the outside, I, I wouldn't know what he made, right? So this is him. If he wants to share it with me, that's fine. And I said, well, how much did you make? How much do you think someone who started a business, grew it to revenues of 20 million in 12 years, took four rounds of funding, which is typical, how, do you, how much do you think he'd walk away with? How much? Five million? Five percent? Well, he walked away with $160,000. And since he was getting divorced, he got half of that. Okay, it's a really sad story. Uh, so that happens, and you don't see these written up, and yet they're the typical story. Typical story is everybody gets washed out. So I, I highly just warn you, don't get caught up in getting money. Build your business, make it successful. If you build a product that can be sold, go through and beta it. Own your business when you're done, okay? If at all that's done and your business needs to grow more, at that point in time, Money will find you without doing anything. It'll come in. People ask me all the time, hey, can I put money into your business? I'm like, we're fully funded and oversubscribed. I'm not taking money from anybody. I'm in that situation where I don't have to, but I don't want to either because I want to be able to let my employees benefit from it. So we're 100% employee-owned. Not every business can do that. I understand that. But in moment did that. And it took a lot more sacrifice in a time where it took a lot longer to get to viability. So I think the chances for you guys doing that are a lot higher. And a company like RevRoad is really in a position to help you because they're in that other category, right? We need a new category part. We need to call it something special. This is really cool that way. So when it comes to then exits, right? So if you've already built it up and you've, you're at the time where an opportunity to exit presents itself, what advice do you have to business owners when they get to that point? as far as the decision to make that exit or to continue building and growing. Yeah, so it's your classic uh, bird in the hand, two in the bush, right? Have to make that tough call for exit. Um, I have a few friends that have gone through exits recently and in and, uh, and the last few years, and I think the biggest problem that happens with exits is people get too emotionally caught up in it. And, and it becomes really difficult for them to let go. And so a couple of my friends were forced out. Anyone ever hear those stories? These typically don't get written up, but it happens. Founders get caught up in things, they hold on too long, and they end up becoming emotional with the whole thing. It's tough, it is tough, I get it. Uh, I planned on uh, not being around when we sold the business, because I knew if I got to the point where that was done, when you sell a business, then you have to hang around for another three or four years. And so we'd hired, a, a, I'd gone to the board two years before, a, I was thinking when we were going to sell the business and said, let's get a new CEO in. I think we're ready for the next phase. And they were elated. <laughs> they were elated that I'd gone to them. And I'm like, don't be so happy. <laughs> I'm like, come on, I did something here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but then we, we, I stepped back into a, put a chairman of the board and chief scientist role. And it was me making that decision because most founders are forced into that position. Okay? Be proactive. Don't be in that situation. Uh, one thing you guys all know is you wear a lot of hats in the beginning, and then you start taking them off one by one. And at some point in time, you take the last hat off. Do it graciously before someone asks you, okay? That's great advice. That's great advice, to take off the hat graciously before you're asked to. Knowing when to step down, that's really great. Um, okay, so you also mentioned that Halo site is completely employee-owned, yes? You mentioned something called the swimming with gold story. Yeah. Will you share that story with us? Yeah, I, I love this story. I mean, mostly because I made it up, but <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story anyway. <laughs> um, so you're on a boat a half mile from shore, and on the boat is 90 pounds of gold. 
what are the chances that you could swim with 90 pounds of gold to the shore? I mean, probably zero, right? I think you'll die trying. I, I view that as most entrepreneurs who try to hold on to their business and maintain all the ownership themselves. Uh, they typically drown, which is why, I, in my opinion, most businesses fail. If you share that out, something wild happens. So on the boat, happened to be five friends. Now each of you have to swim with 15 pounds of gold a half mile. 15 pounds. I've got more than 15 pounds on me. That's not helpful. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could do it. Uh, <laughs> it's not saying it's going to be easy, but doable, right? But something kind of wild happens. When you get to shore, you, you pull up, and instead of having 90 pounds, you now have like 200 pounds of gold. Because when you share the wealth, the business grows. And you, get, you, you free yourself from things. Uh, with Halo Sight, uh, every single person has shares. And um, we're using uh, restricted uh, stock uh, for our founding team. Uh, restricted stock has some really neat benefits. So I said, I, I, I'll give you some, just a couple highlight points here and uh, just enough to encourage you to go look at it. What I like about it versus options, for those people you're giving it to, if they hold it for five years, there is zero capital gains. It's kind of amazing. It's a new change Trump made. It used to be like 50% for founding shares. But now all of my whole team has founding shares. And if they hold it for five years before the sale, zero capital gains. Pretty cool. It gives you a lot of flexibility to kind of pass wealth on in, in a really cool way instead of having it just all disappear in tax. Uh, with options, people typically don't buy options until there's an event, which means they have to pay the strike price, which they typically don't have the money, so they have to work out this weird kind of loan thing that goes on that happens in companies when they sell. And then as soon as they do that, it's now short-term capital gains and it's treated as ordinary income. So this thing you thought you were handing to this employee to give them wealth, because you're giving away the same amount of ownership either way, right? You hand it over to them, they have to come up with money, they typically would wait for that, and then suddenly they're gonna be taxed at ordinary income. I, I mean, you get a million bucks and 450,000 of it disappears to tax. Thank you, I think, I don't know. <laughs> so, so be smart about how you go through and manage your structure too, and RevRoad can help you out with that. Speaking of sharing the wealth, you're also an investor. And so what do you evaluate when an investment opportunity presents itself to you? Teams, it's always teams. Uh, I think that's the most important thing. We're invested in you. Uh, yes, you need to have the staples in place. You need a market, you need an opportunity, you need potential, you need skill set and domain knowledge and, you know, and, and a, 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 some kind of ramp to get there. But we're investing in people. I mean, that's, that's what I come down to is I'm like, let me look at you, see how determined you are, if you're committed in it. Uh, that's the big thing. When someone shows up and they haven't put their own money in and they're asking for my money, I'm probably not going to put any in. I like to see that you've already burned the boats and fully committed, right? So, What would be, of all the experiences you've had, all the successes, failures, the ups and downs, what is the greatest lesson that you've learned? What did I say last time? <laughs> <laughs> you said... <laughs> Which one? No, seriously. Which Determination. One? Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, there's a lot notes. of lessons. I have so many terrible <laughs> lessons learned. I was listening there going, man, there's a lot there. You can choose uh, a different answer if you want. No, no. I was thinking, <laughs> I know it's your story I was thinking of there. That's funny, you're whispering it. <laughs> uh, no, I had an employee work for me at a moment. Uh, he, uh, he wasn't like the smartest person. He, he wasn't you know, the fastest on any particular thing. But this person would run through walls if I asked him to. Which is so cool. He just literally, he was there whenever there was a problem. I never worried about things that he was on. And I didn't care if there were people that were smarter than him or anything else because he was more determined. And that's one thing we all have because of our agency. You can be more determined than the next person. And that's the thing I think is required of any entrepreneur is to be more determined. And, and that's something no, nobody can take away from you. There's always smarter people. I'm surrounded by smart people. It's great. I love being around smart people. They make me feel a little inferior and everything else. <laughs> but it's good to go through and look for that kind of people, right? Hire people that are highly determined, highly motivated, that are willing to make those kind of sacrifices. I think it's great to have a team around you that is determined, willing to make the sacrifices needed. But at some point, would you say there's a little bit of luck and a few lucky breaks, and did you see any of those along your journey? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, every business uh, has its moment, has that kind of, for us, it was the Great Clips moment, uh, which I shared with you across the kitchen table, right? I mean, that was, that was the moment. If that didn't happen, in moment would not have made it. We were coming up on two-year mark, and there was no money left. I mean, it was just, <laughs> you know, could I have gone to try to raise more money at that point in time? Maybe. But it, that was that moment. So there's always kind of those you know, kind of moments you can point back to in a business where all the sacrifice and everything finally paid off. And, and it does. It takes a lot of hard work to get there. Um, with Halo Sight, our magic moment came with the combination of the right things occurring in the space. I'm leveraging Salesforce. Uh, I'm leveraging the whole G GDPR, CCPA, data privacy problems where people are centralizing a lot of their data right now. Works out really well where people are moving their data into Salesforce. Salesforce's service cloud grew 43% last year. So there's a lot of forces at play. And the company I'd killed before this, it was a solar company. And you know what? I couldn't control some of the factors in there. You want to try to reduce your business risks as much as you can until you get down to a handful of business risks that you feel that you know enough about that you feel comfortable with. And that's the problem where with businesses, your ideas you have to kill. So you're like sitting there going, there's these three other business risks out there that I don't know enough about. And any one of them could blow my business out of the water. So figure out what your business risks are. See if you've hired the right people to deal with those business risks. You have the right domain knowledge, the right business plan. Pivot your model a few times. You usually will two or three times to be able to figure that out. And then you're going to have a chance for that magic moment to happen and say we made it. We love magic moments. Um, I'd like to open it up for audience questions. We have about five to seven minutes. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And we have some mic runners who will be running around. Um, and they can hand you a mic. So we'll start in the back with our boy Jeff. Awesome. John, over here. It's good to meet you. Um, you mentioned that it was easier on the third one than it was the first one. If you could go back and, uh, and give yourself some advice when you first started out that first one, what kind of advice would you give yourself? I th it feels like I'm going back to high school, right? That's what we all dream. If I could only back to, go back to high school now. Um, advice I'd give, uh, wow. I, it, it'd probably be specifically along getting that kind of referenceable accounts. Uh, that I, I focused on money, I focused on a bunch of other things because that's what everyone was saying I should do. I kind of look at around on some of that and I looked to other people that they were the experts when I didn't realize I was the expert in the space. Each one of you are experts in your space. You're starting the business up. There's no one else who knows it better than you. It's good to get you know kind of people to test your idea and everything, but you're the expert on it. That's the key thing here. Is, uh, some of my biggest mistakes I've made is uh, where I've looked to people that I've taken money from to help steer my business. And when I've listened too much, instead of just saying, thanks for the advice, I appreciate it, I'm going to make a decision. It's been when I've let that decision be too much in someone else's hand that they've been bad decisions. You're the expert of your space, of your business. Trust your judgment on it. You're going to make better choices than any investor does. You hear prepared talk about it? Bunch of old white guys with money. I mean, making decisions kind of funny, actually. Um, <laughs> I'm part Cherokee, by the way. I'm kidding. <laughs> but I just totally fine, totally fine. I really agree with it because they're not experts. Would you take guidance advice on your blogging, on your food blog stuff from any of these investors? No, never. And, and yet, I, that's the mistakes probably. If I've made mistakes, Jeff, that's, that's the ones. Is that when the money comes in, you begin to feel like they're experts. They are not the experts. I am not the expert in your business if I invest in your business. I'm investing because I believe in you. You're the expert on your business. I'd love to be educated on it, but you're the expert on your business. So that'd be probably the most point. Awesome, thanks. I have another question. It's our traditional question that we ask at every review. What is something fun your success has allowed you to do? Ski more and play <laughs> ultimate frisbee. <laughs> we play ultimate frisbee, we have now for 25 years. 
every Wednesday and Friday at a field. As long as the, there's no snow on it and it's above 32, we play. And, uh, and it, for those of you that say, yeah, I'm going to wait until I have time, just make time, play. I'm 52 and I go out and play with a bunch of 20-year-old kids that run a lot faster than me, but I have a blast <laughs> playing it. And, and uh, I love to go ski. I have a network ski group I ski with every Friday morning. And there's around 70 of us. I'll use there's only about a dozen of us that make it up any week. And half of them are now, you know, clients of Halo Sight. <laughs> I'm saying it's good. So you can mix uh, business and pleasure. Have a lot of fun doing and pursuing those things that you love doing. Question in the back. Hey, John. Great job, by the way. Loved it. Um, what, what role would you say your family has played in your success in your businesses? Uh, that's a great question. So with the, within moments, uh, we had no income. My wife took a part-time job for an adoption agency and received phone calls at her house. That's how we paid the bills. So you make those sacrifices. You always hear the stories or people have done things. For us, uh, my wife made in moment possible. Without her working at home with our uh, two kids, and then soon to be three on that at that time, we had between two and three kids during the early stages there. And it was tough, but she made it possible because she took a job there. And um, having them be a part of your business is a lot of fun. My kids, I have two of my kids working at Halo site uh, with, as interns. I, that's the cool thing about being an entrepreneur. You can bring your family into it. Some people say, don't do that. I don't know. You're in charge. You own the business. Do what you want. Uh, you know, make those opportunities for, your, for the people around you. Uh, I prefer to work with my friends than to work with the expert in the space that thinks they know so much. I, I, th I think it's one of the things we did a kind of a big post-mortem review back to Jeff's question. The three of us that founded Halo Site, we've all done two or three businesses before. And uh, we sat and did a post-mortem review of all the things that bugged us about our previous lives. It was this weird therapy session for like six weeks. Don't do it for six <laughs> weeks. It gets really kind of weird. We had like safe words, like avocado, which meant stop talking about it. And because uh, you're like, all you want to do is start complaining about all the things that went wrong. Uh, but it was really healthy. We came up with a list of all the things. We used that to create the culture for Halo Site. And it's fun to have employees come up and say, this is the best place I've ever worked. And there are people that are in their 40s and 50s, and they're like giving you that kind of compliment because I've worked in a lot of places. Um, that's kind of a cool reward when you do that right. And uh, that, that's what you want to do because one, one of the toughest things, and I'm sorry, I'm just ruminating now, avocado, that's my safe word, <laughs> uh, is, is, is that hiring people, yes, I want you to go out, and we want you to have the best team, but that team that works really well together. Do you think Prepare has some good synergies? I think they have good chemistry? You kind of feel it, can't you? That's really important. That's really important. Uh, choosing people to work with. We're hiring really, really slow. You've heard the adage, hire slow, fire fast. All right? You don't want to poison sitting in your business for too long. You just, it just take your time to get the right people in. Uh, we, I think of some of the things we've done from a cultural learning regarding hiring has been my biggest takeaways that I've had now that I feel like I'm finally doing well with Halo Site. I used to sit there and look at it within moments and say, well, we've got to have a person for that position. Let's go find the best person on the space or someone that fits in this requirements and can, you know, we can pay them this much. And that is not the way to hire. It's just, it feels like it should be. But you want to hire someone that wants to be, that desires to be with you and that you desire to have them to be with your business. Right? That desire has to be both ways. When you hire like that, man, that's cool. You got a lot of great things happening that way. So I, I, that'd be my kind of big rumination kind of thought back to you. Hire right. Figure out what your goals are. Figure out what your vision and your culture is. Um, if you don't have a structure that you're following, go look at Salesforce's V2 Mom, and uh, I can talk to you about it afterwards. It's great. Hey, thanks for uh, being so real with us today. That's always refreshing. Uh, just had a question follow-up about restricted stock. What advice would you give or examples of companies that are outside of like the founding team, the first four or six people, that are kind of moving into those first team building hires? Uh, how do you determine value? How do you determine how regularly you come back and, and give those kinds of opportunities to them, investing schedules, things like that, just in general? Do you mind speaking more to that? Yeah, that's, that's real important. So I think... Um the pitch that we put together is to help employees and their spouses understand our opportunity and potential. And that's a really important point. 
you don't want to hype that. If you're going down the route of an employee-based company, the last thing you want to do is talk about how you're going to be a billion-dollar company, and here you are with no money. Uh, you're, you're, you're having people make sacrifices. Uh, I, I give our employees three choices when they join. Hey, we can pay you, you know, your market competitive rate salary. We can pay you some reduction that you feel you can live on for at least a year. We say if you're going to do this, we want you to do it for a year. Or if you're going to be all gung-ho and come in and go zero pay. I've got uh, half our employees have gone zero pay because they're in a situation where they can do that, right? It's not always that case. But there are a lot of people out there right now from businesses that have gone through and had events that you can go through and hire people that will come to your business for no pay. And just go look on the, and find out all the businesses that have had events here. There's a lot of employees that have come away with money. And that's a cool opportunity for them because they can say, I can come and work for my pay and get a teeny little bit of something. Or if I make a reduction, like for us, we say, you know, hey, if I'm going to pay you 160000 a year, but you're willing to come for eighty, that's a pretty big sacrifice. And so we want it to be exponentially valuable there. Now, that means coming back to talking about your business plan, showing your projections, showing what it's going to be, and being real about it. So I've got what I believe the projections are, but then I go through and show them and say, well, let's say we only accomplished 20% of this target, right? Which is you'd never do with an investor, but you should do with an employee because they're making sacrifices that affect their home and their lives. So we say, well, if we do that, how much would this be worth to you? And two, three, four, five years as you play it out. And then you do some math there. So I, I di deeply discount it for employees Let, and just show them the difference. Say, here's the range. This is your hurricane, you know, where the chart's going to land, right? And there's, there's the optimistic entrepreneur in you. And then there's the pessimistic, you know, where, hey, I'm nesting and I'm taking care of my family. What would it be? And so I'm able to go through and show that. So like for us, at 40 businesses, we're profitable. We have... 25, and we picked up 10 signups last week. So got to go through and follow up with those. But we haven't even begun selling. Our product goes live in June. And we should have enough businesses on that looks like we'll be profitable. So it's easier to kind of put those pitch together when you're getting traction, right? It's a lot easier to go through and do this. But plotting it out, helping them see what it is, and then they know, okay, if I'm going to take $80,000 and not earn it, meaning I'm going to put $80,000 of my salary back into the business, What's it going to be worth to me? I'm asking them to make an $80,000 investment, right? That, that's a big deal. And, and you have to respect that deeply. And when they look at that and say, wow, what are they going to get out of that? To me, I'm like, I want you to be able to pay off your home and get a, you know, a cabin and, and probably a boat. <laughs> <laughs> so you go through, and, and that's sharing the business a lot. If you're not raising a lot of outside money, there's a lot of flexibility there. You can do that. Great. Thank you so much, John. We are very grateful to have you here with us. Hang around, you guys. We have a networking lunch. After oh, do we have another question? I'm sorry, sis. Go ahead. <laughs> I didn't even see you. That's my bad. Oh, no worries. Go ahead. No worries. I probably should have stood up. Uh, quick question. Just uh, would love for you to touch a little bit more on the like the early years uh, and what role work-life balance should play in the early years. Wow. Um, we worked really hard that first two years. And there was zero balance. <laughs> zero. I mean, we were working 20-hour days. And we were, yeah, I mean, I, I sat, and it, if I have a different presentation if you one time wanted to see it. It's a, and, and hear my whole story on that. I spent three months uh, inside of um, a, a little uh, ISP uh, trying to get a piece of, of software working while my programmer, uh, Kurt Williams, sat and tried to get the platform put together. Uh, we'd found that there was a piece of software we needed. It was about a million dollars to license it. Didn't have a million dollars. But I found that IBM offered free software use for one year for anybody who was an IBM consultant, but that you had to pay for the installation and anything else. So in a period of two weeks, I went out and became an IBM consultant. Then I went and downloaded the software and then I spent three months trying to figure out what I'd have to pay a million bucks for. And I was there, I was, I was sitting there in this data center and every now and then I'd just say a prayer again because <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> figure the thing out. And you know, there's a reason they were paying people a million bucks because it was a complicated piece of software. And it's, it, you, it was trying to get it configured. I mean, this is way back, you know, this is 17 years ago, trying to do VoIP, people weren't doing it yet. 
and so it was really complicated. And uh, you know, making those kind of sacrifices, I didn't, I didn't see my kids very much. It was tough. And would I recommend that? No, but I'm not sure I could have gotten around it because we didn't have money. So you have to be really close in touch with your family. Uh, my kids came down and cleaned the place. So and you know, they came down and and worked even though they were young, just so I could see them. So you know, that's how I overcame that. Uh, my wife came down and would bring meals in sometimes to us. I mean, it just kind of make that closeness that was there because if we were going to make that company succeed with really not much out, we, we ended up with about 450000 of outside funding, the target amount. And, and that's how we built the business. So uh, I'm an advocate for work-life balance, but sometimes you get in a situation where you're sitting there going, if we're going to do this, here's what's going to have to be. Be open and transparent with your spouse. Talk it through. And always make the judgment call. It may be better just to pull the plug. Sometimes it is. Great. John, thank you so much. Let's give it up for John Sperry.